All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I am Craig McEldowney. Uh This is Steve Rifkin. He's going to be uh, here and hopefully not talk too much, but we'll chime in when he has awesome stuff to say. Uh, the session you are at is Cook Up Some Stacks of Drupal Goodness with Chef. So who am I? Uh, Craig McEldowney. I've been uh, programming, doing consulting for about 13 years now, uh, web CMS, enterprise CMS, digital asset management, and other stuff. Uh, doing Drupal exclusively for about six years, um, and much of that time I've spent uh, sort of slowly and uh, at a more increasing rate uh, becoming an ad hoc and sort of de facto sysadmin for the sites that I've been working on. Uh, Steve Rifkin is the peanut gallery. He's doing a follow-up presentation uh, about Amazon Web Services that builds on the material here, so you might want to consider sticking around, but he can give you more detail about himself uh, later on. So, uh, agenda, we're going to talk about some uh, DevOps, just introduce the basic concepts, uh, talk about Chef specifically, uh, your kitchen, kind of the tools of Chef and, and uh, the need to know things to get you a little bit on your way to uh, start using it, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what stacks look like in Chef, how to spin them up, uh, and then maybe a quick demo, address questions, and much applause. So, uh, I'm sure that uh, pretty much anyone here that's been developing for, for any period of time comes into contact with servers. Uh, and, uh, you know, some, some portion of the time you actually get out ahead of the client and get to touch them before they do. Uh, other times you get there and they are uh, rat coded and sim linked and uh, poorly configured all over the place. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it's, uh, it's not been real pleasure. So uh, the idea here is to kind of take a step back from all of that put some sanity into your own process for how you deal with servers and uh, get that into your uh, development and deployment process. Um, so, you know, right now, how many people use, like, package managers if you've got to install things on, uh, on client system? Okay, so we've got Yum, apt-get, all those kinds of things. Uh, do any kind of scripting to kind of help you spin stuff up? Great. Uh, has anybody gotten into, you know, baking a, a virtual machine, uh, sort of, pre-configuring a virtual machine, specific configuration, or uh, anything like that, or if you're using Amazon, maybe pre-baking an AMI, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, kind of makes sense. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the goods and bads of that. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I like about uh, sort of having a more coherent DevOps approach in your own development process is uh, you can start pushing that out to the client level uh, and make yourself a little bit more sane by unifying the environments that you work on. Even if you can't necessarily be picky about which OS people are running on, you can still make your stacks uh, look and feel much more similar and much closer to how you want them to be uh, so that as you're, as you're you know, phase shifting between clients, you can uh, you know, know where things are, know how they're organized, and uh, speed up your workflow significantly. Uh, because as we know... Uh, you know, going on to CentOS, and then suddenly Suzy, and then suddenly 15 other different flavors of Unix causes hair-tearing rage because inevitably things are in different places. So, uh, as I've grown as a developer, as I'm sure you all have, you're now a sysadmin on top of your development responsibilities. Uh, great and crap, uh, but you do know how to program. So, what is Chef? Uh, Chef is an open source systems integration framework. Uh, it's uh, built and supported by OpsCode. Uh, it is an awesome product. Uh, it's basically a, a Ruby-based uh, back-end uh, back system. And uh, basically what it lets you do is uh, build out your system configuration in a source code, you know, readable format. Uh, you put together templates, configuration templates for your servers. Uh, you can include business logic in that. There's, you know, programmatic it's it's Ruby based, so you can use all the all the Ruby goodness in terms of adding business logic to your templates, uh, and you can basically use these templates to describe your system infrastructure and establish the relationship between the components of your infrastructure. Uh, and so, ideally, uh, when a new server comes up online, uh, all you need to do is identify to Chef what roles or uh, what configuration you want from it, and the rest of the boxes in the system can then use that information and uh, basically auto-include it, so, you know, it, it, it registers itself with your load balancer, uh, load balancer is aware of it, finds out where memcached is, finds out your database credentials, all those kinds of things. So all those manual steps really get handled for you because the system knows about all of its separate components. 
we'll get into this. Does that all kind of make sense? Awesome. So the idea is basically you've got, uh, you know, you provision a resource, you start to configure that resource, and then uh, the integration portion, which I'm talking about, sort of the auto discovery, auto integration, and putting things to their actual place in the stack. So not only do you have the box itself configured the way you want, you have it actually becoming a member of the stack with no real need for a manual uh, for touching anything. So why Chef? Uh, you know, we've got this ad hoc process that we put together, golden, golden images or, you know, any number of ways that we put together uh, how we support clients. Uh, well, we know golden images. Uh, does everyone know what golden images? Uh, so golden images, uh, I take a box, I take some build of Unix or whatever uh, that, that I'm going to use in my hosting platform, I install and configure it uh, to within an inch of its life. And then at that point, I print it as a, you know, as a virtual machine or as an AMI or something. So that the next time I need that, yeah, stamp it in place. So the next time I need, you know, a varnish server or whatever that is, I just use that same base thing. It's great. It makes for a, a repeatable process. The problem is that uh, what happens when you know, there's a new di uh, a distribution upgrade. What happens if you need to change a configuration file? What if you want to roll that change out across all the 15 clients that you've used that same in image on? Now you have a, a, a decent amount of work ahead of you because you've got to go out, touch all the client boxes, do all the upgrades and migrations in order to get, uh, you know, get everybody running on the same platform. Otherwise, you start suddenly you're, you're back to, even though you've, you know, done this careful process, you're suddenly maintaining... 15 different versions of a server image. So it, you, you can see it's, it's good in the short term, but you can really cause yourself some issues with it. Um, and the idea is take a step back from that and give yourself an automated and repeatable process so that you can spin up a server and as it spins up, it's pulling in the latest versions of everything that you need uh, so that you always know what version uh, of the uh, application stack is running on the, on the, on the service that you spin up. Um, you can break your uh, platform dependency, both on the uh, server OS side as well as uh, the you know cloud service provider uh, side. So you can kind of separate your configuration logic and your your smart about your system configuration from uh, whatever pro provider you're working with. So it's like, well, I, I know how to build a stack on Amazon, uh, but when I get to Rackspace, suddenly I have to reinvent the wheel. Well, no, let's take a step back from that get as much smart as you can and all that specific stuff that, that, that you do good in your stack, pull that away from those specific cloud providers and make yourself more independent from them. Um, something that you'll hear about when you talk, uh, uh, when you talk about Chef is the concept of item, item potency. And uh, we'll get into this when we're actually looking at recipes. But the idea is that uh, you can rerun the same, uh, the same instruction or the same configuration information multiple times and you will always converge on the same result. Uh, the way that Chef works, uh, and we'll, we'll get into this, uh, is basically you, 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 you've got a set of recipes, you've got a set of instructions that you want, uh, or a, a configuration that you want the server to achieve, um, and you can keep uh, rerunning that configuration over time. It's not like a batch, uh, uh, a bash script or something where you suddenly might be adding extra uh, information to a file because every time you run that bash script, you're, you know, you're you're appending stuff to the end of the file, and suddenly over time your configuration files will get all, uh, all messed up. Chef really does a great job of letting you rerun the configuration, and all it does is just bring the server to the point that you desire it to be at. So you don't have to worry about things drifting over time or adding that logic to your configuration to make sure that you can rerun it. Uh, okay, and so yeah, the, the idea is you, you, you're always enforcing compliance. Uh, with your desired configuration, you don't have to worry about uh, what happens if you, you know, have to restart your configuration script. You can always just rerun as many times as you need. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the components of Chef. So your messy kitchen. Uh, one of the biggest beefs I have with Chef is that they take the metaphor not far at all. There's about there's about three terms in Chef that that correspond to chef and kitchens and everything else uh, is. Completely different syntax. So we're just going to touch on kind of uh, a few to give you a, a little taste of what it's like. Uh, there's certainly uh, plenty of digging to be done on this, and we've got some good resources at the end of the presentation to uh, point you in the right direction. So a node, which is, of course, a kitchen implement. It's not a kitchen implement. Already the metaphor dies. So a node, think of as a server. It's just a box. 
So I thought it was a piece of content. It's not a piece of content. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Drupal. <laughs> so, yes, we are we are uh, definition overloading on the Node class. So <laughs> Node is now a server as well as being a piece of content. Um, so yeah, Node is just a server. Uh, the the term Node and client are kind of uh, used a little interchangeably in Chef, but basically, uh, Node is the server. And uh, as far as Chef server is concerned, when you're when it's pulling information, it is a client making requests from the server. But you can basically think of those client requests as originating at the node. So a node is a client, basically. Uh, a cookbook, hey, kitchen, yay. Uh, cookbook is a grouping, logical grouping of a set of recipes. So uh, you know, a great example is Apache cookbook. Apache cookbook will contain not only uh, basic configuration for Apache and sort of handling uh, you know the the base. Uh, you know what ports are running, that kind of stuff. But also maybe some recipes to help you set up vhost, to help you set up SSL, to help you set up other supporting things that make sense with Apache. Uh, cookbooks can kind of help share resources across recipes, so that you can ref make reference to uh, uh, resources or objects that are within that cookbook. We'll get into it. So recipe is basically the uh, smallest unit of of work of configuration work. In Chef, uh, and a recipe can be as simple or as complicated as you want. So, like I said, a recipe might be just install Apache. A recipe might be configure a vhost. A recipe might be install Git. Uh, install you know install an application, or uh, actually take you know script you know a scriptable action. So, recipe is basically the the unit of work that everything is going to be triggered from. Uh, partner to that would be templates, and uh, templates are basically uh, uh, they use uh, the ERB dynamic templating system, and it's basically your way to create configuration files on the server. So recipe will uh, architect or will, will will trigger the actions, and templates are basically used to help drive uh, creating your configuration files. Um, make sense? Anybody? Good. Uh, and uh, one of the easiest ways to organize uh, your configurations is to use the concept of roles. Which basically lets you did right? uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice should be right uh, roles are just uh, a, a punch list of recipes to help you define a specific box because obviously you're going to have certain things that you need on every box that you touch uh, you know whatever favorite tools you have wget or curl or those kinds of things you're going to have some things that are really specific like I'm only going to need uh, varnish and, and supporting libraries on the varnish box, but obviously I want Apache on my web heads. So roles let you organize a set of uh, recipes and logically group them. Uh, roles can also be inherited, so you can have a base role that everybody inherits from and then adds its special sauce. Again, we'll look at those files in a little bit. Uh, little bit. Actually, you know what, let's look at that right now. So uh, this is, you know, a, a base role that, that I'm using on a bunch of my boxes. Um, and you see I've just got a list of recipes here. Can, you, can everybody read that well enough? Um, and so all I'm doing is that instead of any time I'm spinning up a box saying I want all of these recipes run on it, I'm just saying, okay, I've got this larger role, this concept that I want applied uh, for this given box. So I don't have to list everything that I want on it. Every time I spin up a box, I can just group them logically. So uh, all I'm saying is I've got a specific run list of things. Um, we won't get too far into uh, attributes today, um, but yeah, you can you can basically define and customize behaviors at the role level, uh, which makes it really easy to kind of architect a system uh, and and configure things uh, in 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 logical groupings. So we'll, we'll, let's take a. Yeah, like another role, a really simple role, memcached. I'm not doing much with it, but you can see I'm running the base role as well as adding an additional recipe to it. So like I said, you can kind of force inheritance of roles. All right. So how does Chef work? What, is it, what does it actually give you? Well, you know, if I install Chef, um, or how do I actually deploy, <laughs> how do I deploy things with Chef? So... Uh, three ways you can run Chef. Chef Solo. Um, 
uh, Manage Chef and Chef Server. Manage Chef and Chef Server are basically the same thing. The, the idea with Chef is uh, you can use these recipes, configure servers, uh, and, and that, that will work with all these versions of Chef. Uh, what you get when you start actually having a Chef server in place, uh, whether through Manage Chef or through your own, uh, you know, through your own Manage Chef server, is uh, a central box that's going to keep track of uh, all the nodes that are running. And from that, uh, it, it provides a, it keeps a solar index of all the information from the nodes that are running, and you can actually query against that and discover about the system. So the second that you have a chef server that's out there in space, it's keeping track of all the components of the system, uh, which is really great for you know discoverability on the on the sysadmin side, just to run specific commands against components of the system, but also just in terms of actually configuring the system itself. For example, if I spin up a new webhead. Uh, I need to update my load balancer to make sure that it knows about the new webhead, otherwise traffic won't go to it. So if I have a chef server that's keeping track of everybody that's in the system, then my load balancer can query back to chef server and say, how many webheads do I have? Oh, I've got a new one. Here's its IP address. Add it to my configuration. Uh, you know, restart whatever services I need to, and I'm up and running. Uh, chef solo basically is just the, uh, is, is the barest minimum. It lets you push recipes onto boxes, but you, you, you don't get that central aspect. So, knife. <laughs> uh, you can think of knife as a drush. Um, it's basically a command line tool for interacting with Chef Server. Uh, Chef does have a web UI, uh, which is plenty powerful, um, but it, it sure is a whole lot faster to deal with knife. Um, some of the things you do with Knife are uh, managing cookbooks, managing recipes, managing things uh, at the, uh, basically pushing code to the chef server. If you've got a chef server that's, uh, it's keeping your central list of cookbooks, and anytime you spin up a new box, that chef server is going to serve as the authoritative source for any configuration stuff. So you use Knife to uh, push code to it, uh, to trigger spinning up boxes, uh, like we've got here, Knife EC2 server create. Uh, to trigger actions on nodes within the system, uh, discover information about nodes, um, and there's a there's a whole wide plugin uh, ecosystem for Knife that, that lets you do some pretty cool stuff, including uh, cloud specific providers like Amazon's got EC2 in there. There's Rackspace. Uh, there's providers or there's plugins for Knife that uh, that integrate with most of the the large cloud providers. Uh, I will add one more thing to that: is that it, it's all stored in JSON, so it's completely editable. Uh, very simple to go in there and just pop open a JSON file, and you're, you're basically looking at opening, cl closing curly braces, and a couple commas and quotes, and it's very easy to run down that list and see, oh wow, this is how this box is configured, or this node is configured, or this is what Chef Server thinks right now is the author authoritative place for varnish or for uh, my, my NFS box or whatever it is that you're doing uh, in your stack. Very nice. Yeah. So yeah, let's do a, just do a couple demos so you can kind of see. So I've I've got a really simple stack right now. I've just got two servers. I got a web server and a and a, a varnish server up and running. Uh, so and and I'm using uh, Manage Chef, which is uh, provided by OpsCode. They've got a, a free version which will give you up to five servers. Uh, I would strongly encourage you guys to register for that. That's a great place to start, so you don't have to deal with the logistics of actually getting a chef server up and running and can just worry about learning how to use recipes and cookbooks. Um, and uh, I've got links at the end of the presentation for all that kind of stuff, so you can uh, pull from there. But anyway, so uh, I'm using my knife command to say, hey, tell me what servers are running in my Amazon instance. Uh, I can also uh, do awesome things, again, with chef server, uh, like So knife search node roll webhead. So give me a list of all the webheads, and it will give you uh, the information, uh, you know, basic information, IP, all those kinds of things, as well as uh, you know a list of the recipes that are currently running on that uh, specific node. And again, if I had multiple webheads, obviously I would get a list back of this. So you have a, a command line programmatic way to access uh, your system, but also this this search works sort of within the recipes. So Chef Server, great thing for letting you discover things about your system and, uh, and make boxes relate to each other. I can discover things about this box. I can also trigger actions against it. Uh, so for example, if you're dealing in a, if you're in a, you know, a larger stack where you've got multiple webheads and suddenly you've got a git code push 
Uh, do you want to SSH into every box, or do you want to just trigger an action once against all the boxes? Probably, uh, probably the latter. So uh, let me just copy this so I get it right. So I can do uh, knife SSH, um, and again, I can uh, use the same search syntax to discover things based on role. You can discover them based on oh, any number of parameters, um, and then execute this action against all of those boxes. So right now, I'm just doing a chef client uh, request on role varnish. Uh, chef client utility is basically run on all the client boxes. It's how boxes phone home to make sure that they're staying current with uh, their configuration. So this is basically, uh, you can run it on a programmatic basis or you can run it as a daemon on your client nodes um, and just say, you know, phone home every five minutes and make sure that you're current or phone home every one minute or whatever. Uh, make sure you're current and uh, that's, that's how you keep your system up to date, uh, updating itself with any new boxes that have spun up and make sure that everybody knows about them. So all I've done here is just tell the varnish box phone home and, uh, and update yourself. Only some recipes that have the double colon, like Yeah, that uh, that's uh, that's basically like a sub recipe. So there, there's a there's a default PHP recipe, but I'm only interested in. Uh, like yeah. So so like if we look at the if we look at the uh, PHP cookbook. There's a whole host of recipes within it that it provides uh, for various functionality. And so in that run list, I'm only interested in probably module APC, module memcached, uh, and a couple of those. So that's just the syntax to, uh, to, to call a sub-recipe. Uh, all right. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, so is that like, that, are those just returns over and finds all the .rb files, or, is, or do you have to um, you, you make Chef Server aware of recipes by literally uploading them. So there's a, there's a knife command to help this, or you can do it through the web UI. Uh, and you just say knife cookbook, upload, uh, and we'll just re-upload the NFS uh, cookbook. So it's, uh, there's, there's a specific uh, local Chef repository structure that you probably want to use with Git. Uh, there's really great instructions on Opscode's wiki about how to set that up. But yeah, there's like a you know, a directory structure that you want to be in and put all your cookbooks in, and then from there it makes it really easy to sort of push uh, push your configuration stuff from there to the chef server so that, that it can then get out to the nodes that are running. Uh, so all these cookbooks and recipes are a lot of them pre-written that you grab from Opscode? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a, whole, uh, there's a whole community uh, website. Uh, it's called community.opscode.com, and uh, there's a bunch of people that actually have private stuff up on, on GitHub or wherever. Um, but yeah, most you know, most anything you can think of is going to already be run. Uh, is already going to have some kind of recipe for it or a cookbook for it. You know, PHP or Apache or MySQL, those kinds of things. Um, and it, it, if nothing else, it offers you a really great departure point for for customizing for your specific needs. The, the Opsco community is also very active, just like Drupal. Yeah, very, very open. Uh, one of the real cool things online is if you have a problem, you're googling that problem. Usually they have, uh, well, all, all of their, uh, I guess it's their IRC chat stuff is dumped into logs and posted, so it's all indexed by Google. So you literally are watching all of these people have the same questions and conversations that you're looking for, and you can pretty much find your solution in a conversation that happened three days ago. It's really, really, really good. I'll actually go one step beyond that, because I, I posted in the, uh, their, um, their developer documentation is in a wiki form. And so I posted a comment or an amendment to uh, to one of their uh, one of their entries, and someone from OpsCode within 24 hours responded to me personally. Said, you know, this isn't appropriate for the wiki. Let me create a trouble uh, 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 a support ticket for you over in Jira, and they, they handled it just like it was a it was paid support, even though I'm just a you know have a free account with them. So the the you, you know you get community support just like you get with Drupal, but there is actually a company behind this stuff too that that uh, offers support. So really, really great uh, support environment. And um, like I said, a pretty rich, uh, pretty rich set of, uh, of stuff already built out for you as a jumping off point. All right. Um, so yeah, so we've kind of touched a little bit on what you can do with Knife. Um, it's also very, very uh, well written in terms of 
uh, offering help for all the existing commands. So, uh, you know, just as you'd expect from a, a typical command line app, if you just use dash dash help or whatever, you can get help with uh, with pretty much anything you're trying to do. There's even support for tab completion if you if you uh, you know follow the directions on getting that set up. So you can actually even tab complete commands uh, with a knife. Um, so. Again, I mean, you know, when you're looking at building your stacks, uh, you want to sort of logically group things into, uh, into roles, like we've talked about. Uh, and then you can actually go, well, how do these roles actually apply in, in real life? So maybe if I've got a simple stack, level two server stack, uh, I can have a couple roles on the same node, uh, probably just varnish and webhead. And then I can maybe have a utility box that's got a little bit more, uh, you know, just some of the back end stuff I might want. You know, toss memcache on there, toss database on there, toss solar on there. Um, <clears throat> if I wanted to go a little bit bigger, obviously I can start spreading things out. And suddenly I've got a varnish box out in front. I've got a bunch of web heads, maybe in an auto scaling array. And we'll get into auto scaling and that kind of stuff in uh, in Steve's talk uh, coming up next. But uh, obviously you can see how this grows. Um, and again, you if you uh, if you kind of abstract things out into server roles, then you can see how you can sort of define your configuration for each portion of uh, of your infrastructure. Uh, a really easy and a really replicable way, um, and using Chef, kind of let everything join, uh, find its place in the infrastructure, and all the other servers become aware of it. Uh, we'll take a look at this actually in, in the demo session, so you can actually see it happen uh, in place. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to get really ambitious, you will add Voltron to your uh, to your stack and a Squirrel cluster. Um, but yeah, I would say that you can you can get really big with this, uh, which is pretty awesome. So, uh, demo o'clock. So I've got a very uh, incredible website. I built this up custom for you guys, so I hope you appreciate it. Um, and like I said, I've got uh, a varnish box and a web head in my stack. So this is the web head, and this is the varnish box, obviously. I'm, uh... Yeah, you can see that that's being pulled from varnish. So let's say I want to spin up another web head. And uh, because I'm getting so much traffic to my awesome website, and I want to uh, make sure I can hang with it. So again, to the powers of knife, I can from the command line. Oops. I'm uh, I'm saying, hey, uh, in my Amazon instance, I want to create a server, uh, set some general parameters, specify the base AMI that I'm building from. Uh, server size, the name of my security key, uh, the uh, admin user, and then uh, this dash R is for the run list. So right now, you can see I'm just spinning up a web head. So that's going to sit and run for a little bit. <clears throat> and basically what it'll do is uh, it'll uh, request the, uh, the resource from Amazon. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. Uh, as soon as it's able to, it will SSH into that box. It will bootstrap Chef, so it will automatically put all the stuff on there on the, the client box that it needs to be able to talk to the Chef server. Uh, since I'm triggering this from a Chef server, it will automatically let make that box talk to the Chef server. It will download its payload of cookbooks from the Chef server to the client box. Uh, um, and then at that point, it will go, okay, great, I've got all my cookbooks locally. I will actually step through them and configure myself per my cookbooks instructions. So let's do that real quick. And while we're waiting for that, uh, let me just show you a little bit. So here's a recipe that's uh, you know pretty basic. Um, what's great about Chef, you know how I was saying you sort of break your dependence on uh, you know worrying about uh, your stack on specific uh, OS distributions. Um, you can add logic at the uh, at the the recipe level to customize things uh, based on the, uh, the the destination OS. So for example, uh, right here we know that the NFS client under Red Hat, CentOS, and Scientific is going to be NFS lock, whereas uh, Debian and Ubuntu it's going to be STAT-D. Um, so you, you uh, as the resource is spinning up, you actually know uh, the chef can discover information about the system that it's running on and configure itself accordingly. Now obviously if you need to get fancy with this, you're going to be building a lot of this stuff custom, but it gives you a really great platform to go, okay, great, I've got all my business logic and my configuration. Anything that needs to be platform specific, I can customize at the recipe level and let Chef handle 
the logic of it. So I can kind of keep, uh, keep all the smart in one place instead of going, well, this is how I build my Solaris boxes. This is how I build my uh, Ubuntu boxes. Uh, you can really put, you know, put anything, anything that needs to be custom for a specific platform or specific cloud provider in here um, and just let Chef, uh, Chef handle the logic of it. Um, and so you can see, you know, I've, I've got, I'm referencing some templates here, so obviously I'm creating some configuration files uh, that will actually be put on the server side. Uh, let's just take a look at, at kind of what this looks like, uh, at, at, at what um, the dynamic templating looks like. So uh, I'm in a, uh, a template file for Varnish, uh, and obviously Varnish, uh, as a reverse proxy, wants to know about all the web heads that are there. So I do uh, a pull um, in the recipe that calls this template uh, and get just a list of all the web heads. And uh, right here you can see I'm iterating through my list of web heads for each web head. Do this, create a backend for them, uh, and add the host name, or the, uh, the host IP address rather, uh, port and everything like that. And so right here, my system is going to automatically uh, detect and adjust for how many web heads are spinning. Uh, so that if I add more web heads, all I have to do is rerun Chef Client on the Varnish server, and it will update itself. So we should be... Okay, we're still downloading stuff. Uh, but yeah, once this process is done and that web head server is done and configured, then Varnish will be able to re-update itself and uh, suddenly point to the new server as well uh, as a backend. Make sense? Uh, and again, this is this is uh, this is all basically because you're using a central chef server. Because again, that's the guy who that's the guy you're querying against. All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions while we're uh, running through this? Mm -hmm. You have some code on one of the slides there. Uh, no, I think the code I was just pulling in. Um, yeah, right there. Okay. Um, there's one before that. Uh, this, oh, the uh, the recipe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's the action part that says enable and start. Mm -hmm. uh, the start part, I assume, is kind of like okay, we start, stuff you can stop, but the enable part, I don't remember seeing that in most of your scripts for your um, for your start or stop scripts on Linux. So I was just wondering what the enable is. Doing. Um, service is a uh, is a. A, a chef specific resource and so you're basically defining uh, that that uh, this recipe provides this given service and that the uh, available actions on it are start and enable um, and actually well in, in this case it, it's actually specifying to start uh, and enable that service um, but elsewhere where that service is actually defined it will define the actions that are taken when somebody runs the start command or the enable command so this is basically saying run these hooks against this service that is defined elsewhere in the in the recipe stack. You have an ordering difference between the two. Like here, we've got, uh, we've got action start enable, and then next one, we go down about like, mm -hmm. we got enable start. So I'm just kind of curious what the difference is. Um, yeah, I, it, it's this is a contrib cookbook, so I don't know. I don't have a uh, particularly strong opinion on it. Um, it's, it's actually not. I can I can actually answer. Okay. So, so off the wiki, the ordering doesn't matter. You're just notifying the service, mm -hmm. these are the possible things that you can do with this. Yeah. And then in your next step of, of, so this would be defining that, and then in your okay. next step of scripting in the file, you're going to call that service and then provide that action. So you're just notifying the ser uh, chef server, or, or really the your code saying, available. yeah, you can do these types of things. Okay. So and one of the cool things about this is then you can uh, have other pieces of, of cookbooks uh, be notified when one of those actions on this service runs. So let's say every time you do a restart for Varnish, you also want, I don't know, X in it, D to know Varnish is restarting. So make sure that that 443 port is still working. Something like that. And then you can start to run actions. And uh, I, I don't know, for me, the reason I came to something like this was basically because I got tired of having to remember not just the configuration stuff, but that I needed to go every time I restarted Varnish to do something. And you know, sooner or later, the client calls and is like, "Hey, by the way, this pesky issue came back, and it's you know three months later, and you're like, oh, right.' Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, and the nice thing about this is as, as the uh, recipe is actually getting executed, uh, you can, you can um, when you're sending instructions to services, you can send uh, additional uh, parameters like uh, delayed so that if for some reason, uh, you know, in configuring Apache, I'm actually telling Apache it's going to have to restart a bunch of times, like I'm adding PHP, I'm adding APC, I'm adding all these things, you can tell it to delay it so that over the course of actually executing through the run list, instead of restarting Apache 50 times, it's just going to wait till the end, until everybody's done requesting it, and then we'll restart once. Um, so that there's, there's some pretty good smart in, in, in how, things, uh, how things interact there. So there we go. So now we've got our new web head. And we will say hi to it real quick. Okay, so this has just got the default web page. So let's uh, go ahead and tell Varnish. Actually, let me. Uh, Okay, so we haven't rerun Chef Client, we haven't told Varnish to phone home, so at this point it doesn't know about the new box yet. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a single back end defined. Um, so we can either run Chef Client directly on this box or we can do the cooler thing and uh, trigger it remotely. Uh, oops. So now we're telling the Varnish box to phone back home, ask Chef Server if anything's changed. Um, and again, as you can see, I'm sort of rerunning, telling these boxes to rerun their, uh, their configuration scripts. But since this stuff is all idempotent, it's not going to change any files it doesn't need to. And it's, it, it, it's OK to reconfigure against the, the same file. You don't have to worry about your files getting corrupted because of it. All right, so that is complete. Varnish has been restarted. And if we look at backends, we've got two web servers. Uh, so you can see how this uh, gives you a really great platform to build from uh, where you can dynamically toss things into the system uh, if you want to put uh, Nagios or something, and, you know, detect load on your boxes, maybe auto scale based on that. If, some, you know, if a, a box or two is having trouble, automatically trigger spinning up a new webhead. Great, the new webhead will spin up. Varnish will automatically detect that. Uh, you, know, you can scale out your databases in the same way. So you've got this scriptable environment that you can force out configuration and uh, you know, request and delete uh, resources dynamically uh, in, a, in a scriptable fashion. I think that's basically what I've got. So does anybody have any, uh, any other questions? I've got these resources, and I'll post these slides so you can, uh, you can kind of uh, take, a look at, take a look at this stuff uh, on your own, get a little deeper into it. Um, at work, the uh, I have DevOps people who use Puppet. Mm -hmm. How uh, different is this from Puppet? Do they do the same thing? They, they pretty much do the same thing. Uh, I, I, I basically went straight to Chef. Uh, I know it's what uh, Acquia is using, um, and a bunch of the big shops are using uh, Chef. Uh, it's probably, um, I don't know, you, I mean, you're a Puppet user. It's, uh, <laughs> I've, never, I've never looked at Chef. Yeah, but it's. Puppet, you know, Puppet works just as good. Yeah, it's. I think. I think you have the same functionality. There's definitely. Uh, from what from what I've heard, it's uh, sysadmins tend to like Puppet. De uh, developers tend to like Chef, uh, because the, the the configuration of it looks feels a lot more like a programming language uh, for Chef, whereas I think Puppet is a little bit more like scripty looking. It's a declarative language, but you can also write your Ruby scripts and edit. I don't know Ruby, so I haven't done that. But like as far I'm, I I missed the first part of your presentation, but. Uh, I'll be here for the second presentation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's but but the, but with Puppet, the uh, the manifests are, are pretty easy to read. They're, I mean, it's basically just data structures. I'd also add that uh, from from what I've heard, and uh, I went to the uh, I went to Scale this year and saw some presentations, and one was about Puppet. Puppet seems just to be more of an enterprise thing. A lot of larger corporations use it as their, their sysconfigs. Uh, well, Chef is, Chef is newer. Chef so. is newer, and they're kind of the new kid on the block, but they're, yeah. they're, they're slimmed down, and it's kind of not all of the weight mm -hmm. is, is basically what I've heard. So 
but I, I don't have the experience either. It seems like they're both neck and neck competitors. Yeah. So like, you know, I would probably try to learn both well enough so that depending on who your clients are. And again, in scale, we are going to have a DevOps track again, like a three day DevOps track will, will be coming to Chef and Puppet. And that will be happening on three day region in February. Awesome. So nice. Yeah, I mean, I heard that they don't see themselves as competitors so much even. They're both trying to solve the same problem. And they, and they kind of are different audiences. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, developers versus sysadmins. Um, I, I would say uh, just you know for for anyone who's obviously a PHP person here, uh, you, you you need very minimal Ruby to uh, to get pretty far in this. So so don't worry about having to learn a whole new language. You can they they've got a you know enough Ruby for Chef uh, page in their wiki that that really gets you most of the way there for for customizing and, and getting this stuff up and running. So so don't don't be scared on that front. So I haven't yet gotten this to work for myself, but I played around. Bit. And um, one of the things that confuses me with Chef is that it seems like there was a big shift recently in how they do cookbooks. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's now there's a PHP cookbook and an application PHP cookbook. And I was trying to figure out what the hell I use, which one do I go for? It seems like application PHP is like the new coolness or something. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I haven't played with the two. I've been, uh, I'm actually going to probably changing over to, you know, Nginx and, and uh, you know, fast CGI based PHP anyway. So I'll have to figure out which one fits my, fits my need there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, again, you, you're, you're dealing with an open source community backed product. Um, you, you kind of, just in the same way that you'd evaluate any contributed module, you need to look at the, uh, at the cookbooks. Uh, one of the big things that I've been doing in building out my system uh, a lot of cookbooks have a, a, a predisposition for really just being customized on a on a client by client basis. And really, what I want to do is, or you know, what I've done is build a system that I can instance out uh, across multiple clients with having to do very very minimal changes and just uh, pull as much configuration out of the individual cookbooks into a central place into data bags, which we didn't talk about today, but basically just a way of you know sending in uh, configuration information. So. What is your typical workflow with, you, you use Git with this mm-hmm. as well, because you can install it in Git, right, as a vendor branch. Um, I mm-hmm. know there's two ways, there's install and what was the other command? Uh, uh, the, well, there's, uh, yeah, I mean, the way, the way I do it is I'll do knife, uh, knife cookbook site install, <laughs> at, but I have a clean branch that I keep all community provided cookbooks in, and then I keep my own branch where my customizations are. So if some uh, community cookbook gets updated, uh, I can I can diff and decide what I want to pull into whatever stuff I've customized, um, and that that workflow works out pretty well. Uh, it's it's basically the what we're talking about is basically initial uh, it, analogous to like a, a Drush download. It's just get a cookbook from a community. I have a question. I know that you're you don't work for Opscode, I'm assuming, no. but the it has that trial five nodes, uh, but it doesn't say the limit on the trial. Uh, I think it's free forever. Yeah. Free forever. It's, yeah. It's, what I was, it's because it says trial, so I was expecting it to. No, no. I think I think they, they want people using their uh, using their system. Um, you're gonna you'll hit a wall at some point. You know when when you've got more than five things yeah. that you want to do, then you want one role on each box, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, so you're either running your own chef server. Or you're using their hazards. and I mean it, you know it, sh- installing Chef Server on Ubuntu is is really straightforward. The the apt get packages have gotten really good. So once once you get past the uh, the initial you know once you get past five nodes, but with five nodes you can put together a decent sized stack and just start kicking the tires and seeing how pe- how people play together. So you build a Chef Server with uh, using this as first <coughs> migrate everything over to your the Chef yeah absolutely so, because okay. it's it's it, it's kind of like you know, Git in, in that you can have multiple uh, remote endpoints. So it's like, well, if I just want to change everybody over to using a different server, my cookbooks are, are you know, I've got, a, uh, I've got my hands on my own cookbooks, so I can just upload them to whatever chef server, and I would just need to update every client to point to the new chef server instead of the old one. So, yeah, super easy. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Like yeah go, go ahead, go ahead. I tried it uh, no, they're really light. We're running them on micros. It's it's really light, and the uh, the back and forth. Uh, I don't I don't know what the record. Yeah, the, the micros are uh, seven sixty eight megabytes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So 
No. Because the chef server basically all it does is it's just sitting there the, waiting for you. Yeah, the big the biggest thing that it does is is you know indexing and processing new nodes, but but the the amount of data that that is stored in a node is so minimal that it takes Solar no time to do that. Everything else uh, is passed as JSON, so it's really tight. And anytime uh, a client phones home, it basically validates its checksums of the uh, configuration files and cookbooks against what the server has. And so it's a very tight system. It'll, uh, the server will only send updated cookbooks. It's not resetting the cookbooks all the time. So it's, it's, it's actually a pretty quiet system and makes the chef server uh, interaction very, very lightweight. After you, uh, say, build another database server, can you add, uh, push the data from this machine to that machine? To, I'm thinking, like, because I, I, I saw the preview of the Amazon presentation, mm -hmm. you know, in LA. So, uh, say you have your five physical servers that are yours, mm -hmm. but uh, you've created a situation like you do with Amazon, you're going to be able to create another one, mm -hmm. you know, to fill a particular role. Mm -hmm. You can put it up in Amazon. With Chef, are you able to build the recipe to then? Here's my new machine, which is my own. Can we move everything? Over to sure. I mean, you can you can you, you can run Bash scripts directly from within recipes. So anything that you can do in the command line, you can do within Chef. Um, probably something like that sounds like a bit of a one-off. So it's like unless you're sort of like wanting to uh, to have an automated process over time where you're just maintaining a backup of something that's running in the cloud on your own server, so that if there's ever a, a catastrophic failure there, you can cut over. But even then, you can you can you can automate that process however you want well, and. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you, you 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 can architect that and just have yeah, chef manage manage uh, manage the servers. But yeah, you probably wind wind up having a recipe that's triggering bash scripts uh, to actually push the data back and forth. Yeah, it, yeah, just exactly. Build up build up the server and then suck down data from from the other thing. And when you know when it spins up the new server, it can pull in the credentials that it needs from you know your central chef server to be able to access the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, toss you know, dump the database to an S3 bucket, pull it down from S3 bucket, delete the S3 bucket when you're done, um, and and you know you, you'll see when you're looking through Chef, there's um, there's there's uh, what are called resources and resource providers. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's already built for you, like you know if you if you need to create sim links for your server configuration. There's a resource for that. There's resources for uh, actually creating Git copies of your code base that handle a lot of that programmatic logic that you'd have to say to do you know, a Git pull to get an actual deployment copy of your code base on a server. So you know, the, 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 wiki, the wiki at OpsCode is, is invaluable in discovering all that stuff. Uh, the, the other thing I don't know if you touched on, but uh, you know, there, there are lots of other plugins for Rackspace and yeah. all, all other services that you can use for your cloud management. Server management, uh, you know, the whole the whole idea is that you can just pick this up and drop it. And mm -hmm. That's where it seems it's really boom. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and it just depends. You you got to have that use case for. Uh, gosh, I do this a lot, <laughs> and then all of a sudden this makes a lot of sense. All right, we we'll take one more question if the, if there are any, and then. Well, nope. I got a comment. Um, if you are interested in more DevOps stuff, if you look at meetups. The LA area meetups versus the DevOps LA. I think we're meeting tomorrow night. There's also an open stack. Sometimes they talk about certain things uh, along these lines. There's also the UASC, which the Unix and Users of, uh, Association of Southern California, uh, they actually did a puppet camp over at the Media Temple a couple a month or two back. So there's a lot of other stuff. If you can just go up on Meetup and start looking, you'll find a lot of other kind of events going on throughout the week and month. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. And uh, like I said, Steve.